I have Time Magazine here with me. And um, on the front of Time Magazine, it's quite colorful, intentionally so, this week, with all of the colors of the rainbow displayed on it, so that all divisions, if you will, aspects, character of our culture is represented primarily through what is known in the acronym now, the LGBT community. And um, then plastered right on the front of it, overlaid, if you will, inserted in, whatever you want, is the cross. And the title, Freedom Fight. And there are three different articles. The center one, Freedom Fight. To the left, the attack on gay rights. To the right, the attack on believers. I'm not here today to take up this particular topic. You can tell by our scripture reading that we're talking about maybe what's usually commonly called the church and the state or how we are to subject ourselves to the governing authorities. So I'm not here to particularly talk about this particular issue, but throughout this article are aspects of the topic in which we take up. But what I want you to hear in just a few sentences, a couple of sentences that I'm going to read, is not so much, come on, tune me in, not so much the content of what is being said, but who is saying it. So I'll remind you, I'm not reading from the Bible in my introduction right off. I'm reading from Time Magazine. No insignificant periodical today or even in our country's history of periodicals. But I read this one brief paragraph or so. From the earliest days, the U.S. has struggled to balance church and state. Did I mention I'm reading from Time magazine? Church and state, religious faith and individual freedom. The sacred and the secular, with so much wind under their wings, proponents of the LGBT rights have moved the goalposts. As human rights movements naturally do. But after Indiana, you have been, after Indiana, if you happen to be a traditionalist on the topic of marriage, if the passages of the Bible or other sacred books speaking of marriage between a man and a woman still compel you, well, you might conclude that your very freedom to believe is at stake. I got to read it again. Just that last phrase there. But if after Indiana you if you happen to be a traditionalist on the topic of marriage, by the way you do. If the passages of the Bible or the other sacred books speaking of marriage between a man and a woman still compel you and they do. You may well conclude that your very freedom to believe is at stake. Now again, there's a lot that's there that we could talk about, but really my point is Time Magazine is saying that. No conservative periodical. Now the author, and you can investigate that and his background, etc., but the world is recognizing that if you are a traditionalist, if you are a Bible-believing person, that the recent events that have made their way into our headlines are any indication you might be quite nervous about losing your right to believe what you believe. And I'm trying to figure out how that fits, in, fits into a text like 1 Peter Chapter 2, 13 through 17. 
when we are told to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. We're doing it as a kind of a theme here in 1 Peter, taking our cue from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, in which we're challenged to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And we're to do this with gentleness and respect, it says in the text. Certainly this verse has been called upon through the centuries in a variety of different cultures. And you think about, I mean, well, here it is, it's Peter. We can go back into Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, take a look at a little bit of the biographical context of Peter, only to see that, that he was arrested, that he was brought before the governing authorities. Certain things were told to he and John about what they could do and what they could not do according to the state. And, and they responded in a certain way. And now Peter is writing about that later. We can think about Stephen, Stone. We can think about the Apostle Paul in the first century. Even in the second century, a man by the name of Justin Martyr, probably our first primary apologist, and in fact, I haven't said it yet, but when we are in 1 Peter 3.15 and we're told to give a defense, that Greek word apologia is where we get our word apology or apologetics. It's not that we're saying we're sorry for something, but we are making a defense. And so when I speak of Justin Martyr in the second century of being our first uh, apologist, he's the first one to speak out in defense and writing letters to, to Trifo and responding to him and one of the things that Justin Martyr very early on said oh Emperor please understand the Christians actually are the ones who make better citizens of your realm because of the things that they believe and follow we see Augustine writing about the city of God and how that we are citizens of another realm another kingdom beyond this that is the city of God Throughout church history, people have dealt with the state in different ways. Well, there was a time throughout the entire Middle Ages, practically, of monasticism when the idea was what we need to do is just step away from it. We don't need to live in the state. We will remove our, we will completely separate ourselves from the state. And the monastic life took over. We have our monasteries and people just went away and lived isolated from the world. We swing all the way over to the, the Reformation period. We've got somebody like John Calvin who actually I indicates that some sort of theocracy, that is a, a Bible-based community, ought to be set up and sought to make some of those moves in Geneva. We need to follow the guidelines, whereas a reformer of the same time, say Zwingli, was mounting up army armies and saying the way, the way we need to defend our faith against the state is to fight them. We need to go to war against them. Luther, Martin Luther, probably somewhere in between. Luther saying, no, this is not right, but also trying to work with the governors in his state, in his community, and working together like that. Throughout history, they have viewed this text differently. We, we get over to the island of England and, and Knox, and Knox sought to bring some of Calvin's Switzerland, Geneva reforms to Scotland, and he did that. Oh, you think about in England, Henry VIII and all the things that he did back and forth to try and either work with the state or resist the state, or he was the state, how does the church stand in his position? And it almost seems like wherever the church and the state are, it's personal preference for him and he'll make those adjustments and if you lived during those days depending on who was in power you ducked because you don't know this person is for the church this person is not for the church this person is for their kind of church this person is for their kind of state and it was a very tumultuous time in which to live to try and figure out church and state we came over here the the, the American experience, a large part of it built on the fact of we need to find a place for religious liberty. 
for each person to be able to live according to the dictates of their own heart. And then we see these founding fathers in such debate over what they wrote, what they meant to write. You know, the separation of church and state. There are, are many, many Christians, but certainly citizens of the United States, who have no idea that the separation of church and state has no... It's not written in any of our founding documents. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not there. It was a letter written by Jefferson to a Baptist association in which he used that phrase. And others latched onto it. We try to figure out. The Constitution clearly does say that the government is not going to promote. The government is not going to establish something. But neither is the government going to hinder the individual from worshiping in freedom. Perhaps these two things collide. Perhaps these two things are, are unable to live in the same house. Because inevitably, those two things will collide someplace. When my rights conflict with, I use it in a in a generic kind of, your rights, when they collide, which side of the line am I on? Which side of the line are you on? And that's where the real challenge, the real rub comes in how to work those kinds of things out. Especially when we recognize foundationally or introductory, while I'm still in my introduction to this sermon, when I recognize that Peter's environment is in some ways very much like our environment and in some significant ways not like our culture. Certainly they were being persecuted by the church. There were all manner of evil things going on within the culture, much like our culture. And yet the significant difference, at least one difference, that I see in Peter's environment is in these illustrations and I call them illustrations because we're actually unpacking, uh, we're actually unpacking the passage that comes before this all the way back in as far as chapter 1, verse 13 and following. That's the foundation, chapter 1, verse 13 and following. There are three illustrations of what it means to be honored by God as His chosen nation. There are three illustrations, and the first is what we're addressing today, the Christian and the government. Next week, we look at the Christian primarily in the job. And the week after that, the Christian in the home. There are three illustrations of this. And this morning is just one of those. But in illustrating our relationship to our culture, it is significantly different in Peter's in that you, as an American citizen, are part of the governing authorities. Huge difference. This is supposed to be a government for the people, by the people. Such was not the case in Peter's day. A significant difference as we approach taking a look at the text. And so, we come through the centuries. We come to the 20th century and the 21st century. Oh, I'd love to be able to unpack for you the, the words of Francis Schaeffer in his Christian Manifesto to take a look at the founding documents, to do many things that I'm thrilled to look into and examine. And as Christians, we need to set aside time to examine these kinds of documents. But I'm going to do my best to reserve myself to the text. So first of all, this morning, I want to tell you where I'm going. I want to look through the text, and then I want to make some application. So I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, According to this, how do I respond? What is my responsibility? How do I obey this text? By subjecting ourselves to the governing authorities. By subjecting ourselves, by obeying this text to the governing authorities. One, we armed, we're armed with Jesus thinking. Jesus kind of thinking. Jesus dash thinking. So, Jesus thinking. All one kind of phrase I'm putting there together. We're armed with Jesus thinking, Jesus kind of thinking. Two, we disarm godliness. 
When we subject ourselves to the governing authority, we disarm God godlessness. Did I say it wrong the first time? Godlessness. Okay? And thirdly, we provoke a question. So first, the text. Let's take a look at the text and go through it. I hope you have your Bible with you. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or governors sent by him. I'll stop right there. Be subject. You know, I, there's a part of me that says, well, I'm going to really have to try and find a way to get past this word because it's like this ooey-gooey thing. It's, it's, it's a very cumbersome, how am I going to... I can't actually start that way by telling people that they're supposed to be submissive and subjective to it. Maybe the Greek has a different word. Maybe the hupotasso, and, and you say it in Greek, it doesn't sound so offensive. But in fact, I can't do that. To be subject, to put myself under the authority of another person to put myself in subjection, to put myself under the authority, in this case, of human institutions, means exactly what you think that it says here. To subject myself, to put myself under these human institutions. But it says there's some qualifiers going on here. To be subject for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. Now, for the Lord. Uh, excuse me, for the sake of, for the sake of is just one small word in this text. And it can be translated as just one preposition, small little teeny three-letter preposition. And it can be translated in a variety of ways, but I think that it's been translated correctly here. But then comes the, the interpretation of it. For the translation of it, yes, for the Lord's sake. But what's the interpretation of it? Think for a moment. Just get that into your brain for a second. For the Lord's sake. For, for His sake. Well, I would think maybe possibly that uh, it might have something to do with His reputation. Maybe if something is done for someone's sake, then it is to uphold that person's reputation. That's one possibility. Another possibility would be that to do it for someone is to recognize their ownership of it. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that because you own it. You are the owner. And I think that's probably more pointed to what Peter is actually saying here. What I want you to do is subject yourself to the governing authorities because Jesus owns that. For the Lord's sake... Romans chapter 13, beginning of it, the first seven verses are a real parallel to our text here this morning. And there in Romans chapter 13, the Bible clearly tells us that it is God who has appointed all authorities, small or great. They are put in place by Him, and they govern as tools in His hand. Be subject to the for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, I'll leave that just what it is because it is, whether it to be to the emperor as supreme or to the governor sent by him, what Peter's doing there, he's not really going into their culture and choosing the, the highest position all the way down to the lowest position because there are lower positions than the governor's. What is he doing? Well, I would just suggest to you that I think maybe what he's doing, because I think he's in Rome when he's writing this to the Christians who are spread out over Asia Minor. He's basically saying this. I want you to be subject to the governing authorities, whether it's the emperor, the highest level of authority where I am in Rome, or whether it's the governor, the highest level of authority where you are, where you're living in Asia Minor. I think he's actually doing something geographic here, probably. He's saying, no matter where they are, I want you to be subject to their authority. Governors sent by him, that is, the, all governors sent out from Rome, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Interesting. That Peter, writing of the Holy Spirit, the very words that God intends 
actually, when we look into this, I believe, is making an, a, a moral assessment different from the law of God or even the word of God anywhere. I think that Peter is actually saying that all men, all men of all cultures recognize a certain moral standard. Now granted it has cultural differences and I'm not trying to melt everybody into one, but cultures share a great deal of what we would call good and evil. Sure, there are some aberrations, but don't go making the exceptions the rules. I think Peter is writing here and he's, he's saying the governors, the, the, the emperors and the governors, their role is to punish evil. And their role is to praise good. That's it. For this is the will of God. We have, a, we have what we preachers like to call an exegetical, a, a Bible interpreting challenge going on here. For this is the will of God. Is the this, is it, is it prescriptive looking ahead or is it retrospective looking back? Because it says, for this is the will. What's the will of God? Is he about to say, for this is the will of God that doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of, of the foolish people? Is that what it is? This is the will of God that you should put the ignorance of the foolish people, you should silence them? Is that what you, that's the will of God for you to do that? Or is he saying, be subject to the human institutions, for this is the will of God? And it would be easy enough to say yes. <laughs> I mean, he's repeating some of it. He's saying that doing good, so the good is there in the, in, in, the ne in the next phrase as well as in the verse before it. But I think it's the all of it. I, th I think it's the all of it. And so for this is the will of God, that you be subject. Christian, do you hear that? He's repeating. He's not only giving a command, but he's also saying, I want to be very clear about this. This is the will of God that you do it, that you obey your governing authorities, that you obey these human institutions, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. That is, by obeying, you give them no reason, old King James word used to be pugnacious, you give them no reason there in the qualifications of an elder not to be pugnacious. You give them no reason to clench the fist and to point the finger at you. By your very behavior, you shut their mouths. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. By the way, who are these foolish people? What does Proverbs say? The fool says in his heart what? As a general characteristic, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's the difference in this text of Christians and other people that Peter's talking to. They don't know God. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Now here in this particular text, what is Peter talking about, about being free? Partly what Peter is saying here, I want to hold my place. Oh, that's okay. Partly what Peter is saying here is a bit of what I was speaking to you about last week. About the, remember I used this phrase last week, the already and the not yet? Sounds like kind of theological, uh, maybe tongue-twisting, thought-provoking, the already and not yet. I think that there's an aspect of the already and not yet that Peter is referring to right here because he says, live as people who are free. You're free. You're free. How free are you? Well, depending on what you mean by free, and I'm going to take up a quote by Martin Luther in just a moment, but depending on what you mean by free, you're free. If Christ has set you free, you're free indeed. Absolutely free. But now be careful. 
Does that mean already? In the complete sense of the word free? Are you complete? Are you already as free as you ever will be? You are not. You are not free as you will be. Yes, you are already free, but not yet as free as you one day will be. That's the, basically, that's the only reason Peter has got to say it to them. If they were as free as they ever would be, Peter wouldn't have to worry about saying be free. He wouldn't have to say, don't worry about the governing authorities, doesn't matter what they say, just do whatever you want to do. But of course that's not what he's saying because he's, that would be a contradiction in subjecting themselves to the governing authority. Yes, you're free, but not yet as free as you will be one day. So therefore I need to tell you something. I need to tell you to act like who you are. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Not taking this freedom that you think... Because there are people, there are churches out there, there are places preaching what is known as a liberation theology. Why, you're a child of the King. You've been bought by the blood of Christ. You are seated in heavenly places with Jesus. There are churches across some of the largest churches in America teaching the prosperity and liberation gospel. You're free. You don't need to worry about sickness. You don't need to worry about being in poverty. You're free in Christ. What that is doing is taking the not yet and turning it into the now. And Peter is warning against that. But living as servants, bond servants, yea, slaves of God. Listen to how Luther unpacks this freedom. What liberty does Peter and Paul mean? Not civil liberty. They're not talking about civil li liberty, Luther says, for which we have the government to thank. Certainly not carnal liberty, where a man does not obey the laws of God or man. Paul, in this case, is speaking. He's speaking of Romans chapter 13. Paul, excuse me, he's not speaking of Romans 13. He's actually speaking of Galatians chapter 5, in which we are to be free and to act free. But he says here, free from the eternal wrath of God. That's how you're free. This is real liberty, Luther says, compared with which every other kind of liberty is not worth mentioning. Who can adequately express the boon that comes to a person when he has the heart assurance that God will never more be angry with him, but will forever be merciful to him for Christ's sake? That's liberty. That God will never be angry with me again. And so Peter is writing to them, yes, you are chosen by God. You're a holy nation. You're a royal priesthood for His own possession. That's who you are now. But because you are not all that you will be, I need to talk to you about how to live in the here and now. And when it comes to the government, when it comes to these human institutions, I want you to be subject to them while you are here in the here and now. So the general principle closes out the paragraph. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. I think those are pretty synonymous phrases that ask us to live that way. So now I want to bring a word of application. So there's the text. That's what the teaching is. And I have suggested to you that by subjecting ourselves to the governing authorities, Christians, first of all, are armed with Jesus thinking. I get that from the next chapter over. I get that from, I get that from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
So here it is. Since Jesus, is, Jesus Christ has suffered in the flesh, interesting, only place in the New Testament text. Do you see what it says? Interesting word. It says to arm yourself. I go back over here and I look at 315 and it says I want you to be prepared to give a defense. There's no Casper milk toast, just whatever they say walking all over me going on in Peter's mind. Peter's the one that says whether it is right in your sight or not, that, but we, we have to obey God. You tell us after we've been arrested in Acts 4 and the words that we have in, in Acts 5.29. You decide, is it better that we should obey man or God? Who should we obey, God or man? Acts 5.29. And so here in this text, I am actually suggesting to you that by placing ourselves in submission to by subjecting ourselves to the governing authority, that we actually arm ourselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus thought. I have it in my notes, so I'm just going to read it. And now, preacher, you're making me a little nervous because you're sounding a little kind of, a little squishy. You know. I'd prefer you to pound on the pulpit right here and say a few bad things about Washington. But instead, I'm going to read John chapter 18, beginning in verse 36. And I've chosen, I've taken out some things, so um, not that you would not get the full truth, but there's just some other, I didn't want to read so much, that's all. Jesus answered, he's talking to Pilate. Jesus, in his final hour, is talking to Pilate. This is what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate went out again and said to the people, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in... Now, what I'd like you to do for just a moment is, is to take away from your mind just a little bit this whole pilot thing and a private conversation with pilot. And I'd like you to insert this in your mind for just a moment. Would you insert the state? Because we're talking about human institutions. And for sure, pilot is a representative of the human institution who is trying Jesus at this point. So if you can think for a moment, state, human institution, the state, so to speak, went out again and said to the people, see, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I, the state, the representative of the state, find no guilt in him. The state says, I find no guilt in him. The state actually at one point says, justice says, this man is innocent. So Jesus came out wearing the crowns of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate, the representative of the state, said to him, Behold the man. When the chief priests, the religious leaders, and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate, the representative of the state, said to them, Take him. We have a law. According to the law, he ought to die because he has made himself a son of God. And when Pilate, the representative of the state, heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate, representative of the state, said, You will not, the state said, You will not answer me? You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him. This is important in having Jesus' kind of thinking. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. You have no authority. 
when you and I have Jesus kind of thinking, when we arm ourselves with Jesus kind of thinking, we can then submit ourselves to the governing authority because there is an authority above them. We arm ourselves with Jesus kind of thinking. Secondly, we disarm godlessness. He says it in the midst of, of the text here uh, going on, th these foolish people. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of the foolish people. I, I think that when we subject ourselves to the governing authorities, we disarm them. Now the question in the text, though, is, is what does this doing good mean? What, what does doing good that silences foolish people look like? Come on. What does doing good that silences foolish people look like? Does it mean, hey, the text says be in submission to the authority. Whatever you people want to do, it's okay by me. Whatever course of action that you choose, whatever laws that you want to put, the Bible tells me to be subject to your laws, and so whatever it is that you want to do. I think two factors, one I gave you that I'm not going to speak to. Don't forget that you also, in some sense, some limited sense, are the king. To some extent, living in America as an American citizen makes you the emperor or the governor to a certain extent. So don't forget that. But does this simply mean that the state gets to pass whatever laws? No, I don't think so. I don't think that, that we, even according to 1 Peter, who is not in our context, I think the integrity of our conduct should leave the foolish, the one who says in his heart there is no God. I think that, it ought to, that our conduct ought to... The way we conduct ourselves ought to drop their jaw in silence. Does that mean that we obey the state no matter what? Is there ever a time for civil disobedience? I think there is, but I only have time to list it, so I'll do it. If you're taking notes, I'm going to give you three. Uh, is there ever a time for civil di disobedience? I think so. Number one, we must obey God rather than man. Acts 5, 28 through 29. But let me quickly say, make sure that's really on the line. Did you hear me? Make sure that that's really on the line. I, I, I've been in conversations with folks before. Oh, well, Acts 5, 29 says that we've got to obey God rather than uh, man. You know, and they say this, and... and and sometimes, and I, I don't have time to illustrate, but sometimes in those conversations, I'm hearing petty arguments, petty things, minor things that don't rise to the level of me bringing up Acts 5.20. And when you do that, when you do not engage in Jesus' kind of thinking, and you want to play, sorry for the, for the metaphor for a moment, the, if you want to play the trump card, and it doesn't rise to the level of using the trump card, you're actually doing the opposite that you hope to achieve. Oh, i got to obey God rather than man. Oh, really? Does God say that you shouldn't do this or that? Well, no, I guess I can kind of do this and I can kind of do that. But, you know, i got to make sure that when you claim I have to obey God rather than man, that it rises to the level of argument that you're trying to make. A little ambiguous there, I know. But I wanted to get it in there. B, we cannot follow an evil command. Daniel didn't do it. Esther didn't do it. No. Daniel was told, you can't pray. Don't pray. Daniel goes to his room, opens up the window so everybody can see, gets down on his knees in the light of day, and he prays. Esther says, I know it's not legal for me to go into the presence of the king without an appointment. But maybe I've been created for such a time as this. And Esther goes in. But in both of these cases, Daniel and Esther and some others that we could pick from the text, 
when you choose not to follow the state in civil disobedience, even when they've laid this down, you need to be able, you need to be ready to arm yourself with Jesus' kind of thinking. Who did what? Was Jesus guilty? I had just read John. He was not guilty. He wasn't guilty on a religious sense. He wasn't even guilty on the state sense in either situation. But he didn't pray, Heavenly Father, get me out of this. He didn't ask for 10,000 angels to come and take him down. He said, for this reason I came to earth. And so if you are going to choose to disobey the government, be ready to suffer the way Jesus suffered. And that is, and that is, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, bearing the shame. I'm not saying don't disobey in some instance, but don't nullify your testimony by saying, you said I couldn't pray, I'm going to pray anyway. The state comes in and arrests you and you panic and you fall to pieces and you scream or you get, you, you want to call up the, now you want to call up the, the secular people of the world and say, man, this is unjust that happened. You need to print a whole magazine about how unjustly I've been treated. You know what you just did? You just destroyed your entire witness. It's for naught. If you're going to disobey, you need to do it with Jesus' kind of thinking. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, bearing the shame. That's what it means for the Lord's sake in this particular C, sorry. Consistent with, that is, I think civil disobedience is okay. We do have to obey God rather than man. I think that it's okay so that we don't follow through with an evil command. And we're facing some of those things in our society today. But if we're going to disobey it, Christians, let us disobey it Number, th well, stay with me. I'll finish that sentence in a minute. Consistent with normal Christian behavior, but not commanded. When I'm asked or told that I cannot do something that is normal Christian behavior, but I could do it or not do it. Hey, years ago, we used to smuggle Bibles in. I, uh, I went to Uzbekistan once where we were not allowed to uh, teach the Bible. And I was snuck in, and put in a closet of a room for a week. I was allowed out to teach and back in. That's all, in and out, because we were illegal. We weren't supposed to do it. That's normal Christian behavior. Teaching the Bible is normal Christian behavior. Is everybody called to do it? No, everybody's not actually called to do it. It's not commanded that you go to uh, a country where it's illegal to teach the Bible and do it. Or else I'd be standing up here saying, all right, where are you going this week? But it's not. It's not commanded of everybody. It's okay. But if you choose to disobey, be prepared once again to suffer the consequences. I like the way Robertson McQuilkin, a professor, and I'm glad to say friend of mine, put it many years ago. Thus, when commanded to disobey the revealed will of God, the Christian must disobey. When you're asked, when you're asked to, uh, when you're given a command to disobey the revealed will of God, the Christian must disobey the human institution. When forbidden to do something good that is not mandated by Scripture, the Christian may, under some circumstances, disobey the human command. My real point is the last one, and I, I do it as I slide my notes together, and some preachers close their Bible. I don't recommend that because too many people close their mind when too many preachers close the Bible. The whole point for me is this last point, and that is that when we submit ourselves to the governing authorities, in the way that Peter is describing it, we provoke them. I kind of like a little bit of Paul's language in Romans chapter 12. It says, leave vengeance up to God. 
do good to everybody because when you do good to them, here's the picture. I love this. I shouldn't love this picture, but I love this picture. It's like taking hot coals and pouring it on their head. That's what the Apostle Paul said. In other words, by doing good, by conducting yourselves so that their jaws just drop and, wow, I never saw anybody act that way before. You're provoking them. You're pushing them. And according to our text, we're hoping for that. We're hoping for that. They're pushing at us. They're, 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 here's my microphone. They're poking us in the chest like that. Guess what? That's what you want. You're provoking them to ask a question. And that indeed is what 1 Peter chapter 3.15 is saying. When they ask you to give a reason, be prepared. Why are they going to ask you for a reason? The reason they're going to ask you for a reason is because in this text, you are submitting yourselves to the governing authority and you are shutting the mouths of the foolish in such a way, in such a Jesus-thinking kind of ready-to-suffer kind of way, they are in awe. I never saw anybody act this way before. Instead of a church of decades long ago, even to bring it up into the contemporary illustration, instead of a church, or in this case, a business that I'll talk about more next week, putting a sign in their window that says, no gay people, no lesbian, no transsexual, bisexual person, we don't want your business here, however they say it. It's in the window. You're a baker, you're a photographer, you're a florist, you're, you're whatever. None of you people are welcome here. My constitution says I don't have to do business with you. Peter is saying, to a certain extent, why not write this? Everyone welcome. We gladly are here to tell you why we love Jesus. Everyone welcome. Come on in. We are waiting to tell you how and why Jesus lives in our hearts. Where are we thinking like Christians and inviting to come in? Pray with me. Lord, we need wisdom. We don't know how. We don't know how to submit. We don't know. We need so much wisdom in when to follow these principles. There is no set answer. But I pray, Lord, that you would help this congregation to be clear about the focal point of this text. Like Paul said to the Philippians, for us to have the mind of Christ, for us to demonstrate ourselves in conduct in such a way that, that the fools, that the godless are put to silence, that they're disarmed. They, just, they don't know what to do. They don't know what, how to answer because of our conduct and our words. And I pray that that would result in provoking them to ask by the power of your spirit, leading them to yourself. So Lord, in, in the days, weeks, months, years that we have left, teach us what it means to have the mind of Christ, to think in the same way that Jesus did, that we may be your witness in this society. In Jesus I pray, amen.